Hello everyone, I hope you're doing super well today. Um, so the other day I was having some Indian food, and I thought, well, why not analyze data of an Indian restaurant? And so if you click on this link, it gets you to a Kaggle data set of Indian takeaway food. Now, um, I don't know, I was just hungry, okay. So anyway, so let's just look at this data for a sec. So this is a set of all online orders that were placed at this restaurant. So you have an order number. You can see it's kind of multiples, like there's like multiple rows of the same order number where each row represents an item that was ordered for a particular order. So if you take all these six rows together, the first six, I can't, I can't highlight. Yeah, all these six rows together, you'll see they represent one order consisting of six unique items. And um yeah just our corresponding prices and well the total will be like six items so the total number of products is six and that's it now given this data let's say that i own this restaurant and what i think would be really useful is like if i know the number of orders that are coming in on a specific day i can hire adequate staffing for you know since these are online maybe i'd want to deliver these orders personally instead of using services like doordash or whatever it is right and for that i i could appropriately just staff if i knew like okay we're gonna have a lot of volume coming in two days from now i want to be able to staff for two days from now right and get appropriate drivers so that we can uh, deliver these orders adequately instead of being inundated and being surprised on the day. So that's kind of the entire gist of like our objective here. So we want to forecast our order volume for staffing, in this case for, for let's say, hiring interim drivers, right? And we can do this on the fly, daily, just to keep things simple, right? Uh, so yeah, that's about your data. And what uh, the way that I want to approach this as a time series forecasting problem is uh, it kind of harkens back to my video that I made a while ago in January where um, I made a video on time series forecasting with machine learning and I kind of broke down this chart here where I say there's two approaches that you can take. One is using like traditional time series models, kind of like, you know, the univariate models or like, you know, ARIMA, typical time series forecasting way. Or you can use machine learning models and try to treat time series as a regression problem. Now, when I mentioned this, I know there was like a lot of confused faces of like, okay, what's what's going on? How, how do you treat it as a regression? Could you frame your data a little better? I explained it in the video, but this time let's try to do that same thing in code. So we're gonna do some order forecasting, but in a way that's suitable for regression. Okay, so cool. Let's just now actually jump into the code. First of all, I'm installing like pandas SQL here. And this is mostly because, well, in the real world when you're actually, you know, working, you would be using SQL to query a database as opposed to just manipulating data frames and CSV files. And at the moment, I do not have access or connectivity to a database. And so I use pandas SQL to kind of mock that experience so that the code is as close to as possible as what you could be doing in, you know, if you were working for this Indian restaurant and coming up with an order forecasting. Cool. All right, so importing a bunch of libraries now. Pandas, data frame manipulation library. Seaborn, good for those pretty visuals and pretty plots that we'll see later. Same with matplotlib. And uh, sklearn, importing test train split to create our test and train sets. Um, and then we have an xgboost regressor, which I'll be using as the main model for this uh, time series forecasting. Um, yeah, and then on this line, I'm importing pandas SQL. What it's doing here is that it has this uh, function called SQL DF, and we are creating a built-in function ourselves called pi SQL DF, which is a one-line function here that takes in Q, which will be a query, and it will execute SQL DF along with passing a set of global variables. So instead of just calling SQL DF, passing your query, and passing the set of global variables every single time, all I need to do is call Pi SQL DF and pass in the query, and we are good to go to execute the query. Cool. All right, so now I'm just reading the same CSV that I showed you in the Kaggle note in the Kaggle uh, data set, and I'm renaming those columns since uh, the columns had like spaces that are not really friendly to us. So 
looking at two of these orders, well, this is just how they look in general. Uh, the, the problem with this timestamp right now is that it's in a very strange string format that's not exactly in the form of a timestamp because it doesn't have a second seconds uh, field here. But we can kind of finagle our way into just extracting just the date part and then converting that into an actual date time variable. And I put that as an extra column right over here under date. So these two columns should be the same, which they are. They represent the same thing. And now the total number of orders in this data set is the number of unique uh, numbers over here in this column. And that's 13,397, which kind of agrees with what we saw in the Kaggle data set. Cool. Now I am loading a query. I'm lo well, basically, well, I created this little helper function that helps us read a file and load its contents and return its contents in general. And this is pretty useful when you're dealing with SQL queries because many a time I like having my SQL queries, especially if they're huge, in a separate file. And I'll be reading from that file so that my notebook looks, you know, looks pretty clean, right? Uh, so let's do that. So first of all, I'm literally reading the query from query slash daily orders uh, dot SQL, which is a SQL file that I wrote. Um, and I'm just getting two of the samples from here, which that which my file returns. So it's basically a date and the number of orders that occurred on that date. Now, if you're curious as to how, like what the query really is, I just wrote up a really simple query right here. So let's go to daily orders. <clears throat> Excuse me. So yeah, here it is. So first of all, I'm selecting the number of dis So I'm basically saying, hey, just get the order number and get the date, right? And get uh, just distinct order numbers and dates because that's all the data I'm interested in. I'm converting date into an actual date because this is technically a timestamp. You don't want that. Um, and then I'm just doing a simple group by over here where we're taking the date, we're grouping by the date and then uh, getting the number of corresponding orders. So for every date, we have the number of orders that occur. That's it. Uh, let's go back. Where did I go? Sweet. All right. So that's what gives us the resulting data frame. Every single day, we have orders. Now, I'm right down here. I am kind of importing logger and setting the level to log and critical because Matplotlib, at least the version that I have installed, kept on throwing some infos. They weren't even warnings. It was just some of the developers wrote logging.info and put a message in there. And I just didn't want those. So I just got rid of them for now. You can comment this out if you want to see what those that information was. Anyways, I'm plotting this chart now. Uh, the x-axis is the actual dates. The y-axis is the numbers. So basically uh, plotting out the data frame that I just printed. Now you'll see here that I put tail is 50, which means that I'm only grabbing the last 50 rows of the data frame because the data frame, I mean, if you kind of see in the sample here too, it goes, it goes back pretty far. Like there's, it goes back even like 2016, you know? So I just wanted to get the last 50 samples and yeah, I'm printing it out. Uh, but when looking at this data itself, I see that, well, the average orders is like 15. And honestly, I don't like as a data scientist, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing like 15 is like in itself in a margin of error. Like that's a little too noisy for us to even bother forecasting. Um, and so I think we can make a decision to just, instead of like saying, hey, I wanna know how many drivers will, I mean, how many drivers we need to staff on like tomorrow, day after, the day after, and every single day, I want to transform the problem into uh, a weekly aggregation where, so I have all the orders until today that I can look at, and I want my model to determine how many orders will we get in the upcoming week? And for the sake of simplicity, let's say that I want to, um, I only make the predictions every Monday morning. So every Monday, uh, I go to work, right? And I want to see, I run the model for inference, and I see, okay, how, how many orders will we get in this week? Once we get that number, I can staff the appropriate number of drivers because that's all the heads up they need for now. Let's just assume that's the case for this company. 
So with, when you look at this as a data scientist, you kind of need to revisit the problem, and there is definitely a chance that you would need to restructure it. Hence, all the exploratory data analysis is very useful because it helps give context to your problem, and that also informs business decisions. You see how everything's tying together? Yay! I hope you do, at least. So yeah, I put a little note here. Two less orders to bother forecasting. Let's look at weekly order volume instead. And so, what we do is, well, I now wrote a query for getting weekly orders. Um, that kind of looks like exactly the same data frame. If you're interested in the code, let's look at that real quick. Okay, so again, we're getting like the number of distinct orders. I'm casting, converting date into an actual date here. And then, you know, this is a, it, it, this line took me a really long time. Um, so Panda SQL uses a flavor of SQL query formatting called SQLite. And I am not a big fan of SQLite. Um, you know, it's just another flavor, flavor kind of like MySQL, Postgres, Snowflake. Yeah, all of those, right? Um, what, what this does is essentially I'm trying to get the, for every single date, I am trying to get the previous Monday, right? So basically it says date, I'm going to add one to that date. I'm going to get the corresponding next Monday of that date. And then I'm going to subtract seven days to get the previous Monday so that every single date that you see will be a Monday. And how you would interpret this in the code over here is that, Okay, on the week of, so this, um, what is this, August 13th, 2018? On August 13, 2018, or the week of that, that is from August 13th uh, to August, what is the 20th, 19th? Yeah, 19th, that is that next Sunday, we had 94 orders come in, right? And that's what it represents here. That's what each row represents. Weekly number of orders, where each of the, the week is basically a date, on a corresponding Monday. I hope that's clear. It is clear, Mr. Halthor. Thank you. Okay. Next, well, I'm kind of doing the same thing like I did for daily forecasting. I just wanted to plot it out just to see what these numbers look like. And it looks like now these numbers are more hovering around like what, 80? 80 to 100 orders, which is acceptable. I mean, that seems like a reason that seems reasonable. Obviously, when you think about restaurants, it also is pretty less. But for the sake of this problem, I think, well, we'll roll with it, right? It's cool. But one thing I'm noticing already here is uh, you can kind of see like here <laughs> from uh, September 2nd to like September 30th, there's a huge gap. There's actually nothing there. So it's like for a period of two weeks, we had no orders. Same thing in the month of October for a period of a week or two, we had no orders. Same thing in like November too. So it kind of makes me a little que question a couple of things about this data set in general, but this is our data. This is what we have to work with. I'm not gonna question it right now. Let's just do it, okay? So, all right. Now um, I'm creating this query called base.sql. Uh, this is going to create our data set. Now, right now we are treating this problem as a regression problem. And because of that, we have, well, for regression, we have inputs and outputs. The inputs will be features, the outputs will be the label. So let's just look at this first column right here, right? So this was the same kind of uh, uh, column that we saw before where we had 94 orders on the week of the 18, uh, of August 18, 2018. Now we want to predict this 94 on this date, August 13th. Like I wake up, I go to work, um, August 13, 2018, that's today. I want to run my model, and this is the number that I should be getting because this happens in the future. For the next week, I get 94 orders. Now, what are the inputs? They are my features. And in this case, let's just say that I want to um, give typically past orders. All we have is now past orders. Past orders can inform, can inform future orders. And so I can say, okay, well, the model can use the number of past orders order, how many orders did we get in the last seven days? That is from August 8th till August 13th, that is today. And I want to use that to inform my decision. And you can see there, they are actually pretty close. They, it will be a good feature in general. But what I found also was really useful is adding another feature, which is like a 30 day count. So it's like, how many orders did we get in the last month, right? And then use that to also inform our decisions. So you can see um, basically both of these kind of help address, they can, they can help create a trend. So if you have 
more of seven days and it's closer to if, if this is greater and there's a less gap between this number and this number, it would mean that we are we are actually increasing in sales. Whereas if it was the opposite case where, you know, this would be super low compared to the 30 day count, then that would mean we are in a decreasing sales and that will help inform this variable over here. So you can again play around with this. Typically though, in I, I'm only using two features here, but like typically I would add other features like, I don't know, weekly seasonality, for example, where you would take like weekly variables and inject them to our model or anything else in your data that might help inform decisions. Unfortunately, this is a Kaggle data set, which also has a lot of spaces in between. So like this is all we got to work with. It is what it is, you know? Uh, my hunch though, you know, coming into this is because there's so many gaps, our model is not gonna be that great at making these predictions in general. Like no matter what model you throw at this, because the data is like this, like I don't, even in the daily case, like I didn't see any like daily seasonality of sorts that really stands out. It's not like Mondays we see more sales or anything like that. And there's like so many gaps in between that, you know, weekly seasonality is also affected here too. So I don't see any kind of seasonal trends that are that are really being captured at, at, a, at a uniform rate. Like it might look like, you know, okay, there's like bumps up and down everywhere, but they're not really at a very uniform rate enough for us to, you know, kind of eye open or capture, right? And because of that, a lot of this data is just going to be a little difficult to predict in general. But that's okay. We're, 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 let's roll with it. This is the data that's given to us. This is the data we have in my company. So let's roll with it. Uh, so yeah, now what I'm doing is I'm actually querying for, you know, this these order, these two features and the label. And I'm constructing this entire data frame. This is just three samples from the base query. Um, I showed you the output first of the query because the query can get a little involved, but we can walk through the we can walk through the process. It's totally cool. You know, it's a pretty sizable query. So I'm using a, so you've seen this before where I kind of encapsulate all of uh, these query chunks, logical units into uh, CTEs, common table expressions, which are extremely useful to learn and understand. So I highly recommend you do. Um, so this first CTE now, it just grabs distinct orders, like order number and date, which we have been doing for a while now. Um, next is weekly orders. So now I'm getting the number of orders by week, uh, which you kind of saw before. I think this, this is a, an outdated version. I think I have to replace this week query with, uh, with like, there was like a huge, yeah, like this, I think I should, I don't know why I didn't update here, but I, I did run the numbers while updating it. So the number should be fine. Um, yeah. So you get like the number of weekly orders over here. Again, these are like distinct logical units. So now with this is I'm trying to construct that feature for the, um, you know, getting all the orders that happened in the last seven days, right? What we do here is now, well, we do weekly orders. So for all the weekly orders, I'm just giving an alias as order since it's easier to type out and taking all the, so weekly orders, well, these orders, I'm only extracting the date or rather the week, right? And this is the day on which we want to make the prediction. Now, in order to do that, I need to join it with uh, all the orders, all the orders that happened in, you know, all the orders that happened in the past. And what I want to do is I want to join with this distinct orders, but only considering orders that happened from seven days ago till today, right? And hence this join operation. What SQL does is like, this is the main date and this will subtract seven days from this date. And this is this this is a SQLite syntax. I'm not a fan of it, but that's how it's written. And so you'll be getting it uh, without you know with just this the output of this table would be like a bunch of weeks, and then the corresponding number of orders that happened within the last seven days of that date, which is week corresponds to, right? And yeah, this will be one of our features, which is orders last seven days, which was the one of the features there. And now we do the copy paste thing right over here and we get the orders that happened in the last 30 days just by replacing this one thing. And this constructs our second feature, right? And then we have a label. Now the label would be the same thing, but in the forward direction, right? We want to get for every single week, just get the data that's seven days ahead. So all the orders that happen from today till seven days after us. And that's what this join is about, right? And so weekly orders corresponds to today's orders and distinct orders. I called it label orders because it technically is a label just for the sake of naming 
clarity. And yeah, in this way we construct our label. And now all we need to do is join all our features with our labels, which we do right over here. So we're doing left joins here because there may be certain situations where, you know, we don't have uh, seven day orders or we don't have, you know, orders in the last 30 days, which clearly is the case because we saw how, how much um, sparsity there is in our data. And I'm using this coalesce right here because basically they'll say, okay, if this is a nan or none or null, then we replace it with zero, which is the case, right? If it doesn't exist, that means that we just didn't have orders on that day. And I do that for all of these variables here. And so we have the corresponding week, which is the day we're making the predictions. We have the two features right over here, which is seven days back and the 30 days back uh, features of number of orders in those time periods. And then we have a label, which is like the total, well, number of orders that we will see in the coming week. That's the future. And we want our model to predict this. And um, just for the sake of uh, cleaning my data up, I just want only my, all my training data will only go back since 2016, January. <clears throat> Nothing before that because it's very, very sparse when I looked at the data. Um, so, yeah. And so we construct this data frame. I hope all of that was clear because that was like the main chunk of constructing this entire frame altogether. Okay. Now what I'm saying is, okay, the features are, well, these two, these two columns are the features and I'm assigning the label as this. And what we're doing is we are splitting our data into test and train sets by time period. Now I'm not going to shuffle this data because I want my test set specifically to be completely after my train set. And if you were to shuffle your data, it would lead to data leakage. Basically you'll be predicting on situations that are in your, you know, that are, that happen later. Like you're training on data that is later than what's in your test set that will lead to data leakage. And even though you would see great performance, your model in the real world will be really bad. And so you don't shuffle your data because it's time sensitive or time cohesive, right? And then we just split index train and Y train, next test, Y test. And now we pull together our uh, XG boost regressor. So with this, first of all, we're passing in, when we create our regressor, we're passing in like, we're basically using 500 uh, decision, we're, we're using 500 estimators or base uh, estimators or base trees that are used to make the decision. Typically, more it is, the more complex and the more uh, in, you can catch more and more errors that your previous uh, trees have made. So typically higher is good in general, but you can fine tune this number yourself by looking at how well or how fast, um, you know, the model is able to pick up on the nature of data you have. And then it specify a learning rate. Uh, and then when we're fitting this model, I'm passing, I want to fit it on our train set, but when evaluating, I wanted to sh uh, display evaluation metrics for both the train data as well as our test data, just to see, you know, what's up. And what, what we're evaluating is the MAE, which is mean absolute error. Now, one thing to really clarify here is that the training in um, XG Boost, it happens using, right now by default, it's using the squared error loss, right? It takes a difference between the, the prediction of the label and squares them, and that's, that's how it's computing the loss, and that's the objective that it's minimizing. Whereas right now, the way I want to display it is using mean absolute error which is just the absolute difference between the prediction and the uh, label. I'm displaying it with mean absolute error because to me, that's just a lot easier to see. Um, like when I look at, you know, this data, for example, validation zero, this is the train MAE, this is the test MAE. And then when it, you can see it's going down. So there definitely is some predictive power. And this would be like the final, you know, test uh, MAE, right, that we're getting. Now these, you can see that, you know, towards the end here, the MAE is slightly increasing. Again, it's because of the reason I mentioned, because XG boost optimizes the squared loss, but we are computing a different loss. And my hunch is that like, we can't, we can't really um, optimize the mean absolute error directly for XG boost because um, it requires like a non-zero second order derivative since it is kind of a, a form of gradient boosting. We do need second, we need order level derivatives. And so because of that, um, we can't, we, it's not an option to, to uh, optimize. I'm gonna have to confirm that though, but that's, that's the intuition. 
and I, I'm displaying MAE again because it's just more visually intuitive here. So when I see 30 here, it's like, okay, on average, we're like 30 orders off the, the prediction, which honestly is kind of high, but it's okay. We, we can roll with it. It's the data that we have. Um, this actually just goes to show that, you know, <clears throat> your, your predictions are only as good as your data. So if you have good data, you'll get cleaner predictions. Anyways, right now, so now we can make predictions with the, with the test data. And I'm just kind of forming this into a data frame. Uh, yeah, I'm creating a panda series, creating a data frame out of it right here. And now I'm plotting this data. So I'm not sure if I even explain this, but matplotlib has RC params that I've set a default figure size to be 17 cross three and the DPI uh, to be 300, which I think is required because like you want that high resolution. Otherwise by default, matplotlib uses like, I don't know, a hundred or something like that. And now what we're doing is we're plotting out the, um, the predictions right now. So weekly orders tail, 50, which is exactly the same graph as we saw before. I think I explained this too. And um, yeah. And then we have the actual test data frame, which is this orange line that corresponds to the predictions. And you'll see that, well, we're pretty good at making these predictions, especially over here. Except like, I think when we come down here, we're consistently under predicting. And well, one part of the job as a data scientist is to kind of like understand like why this would be happening. So if you kind of look at the data though, actually look at the data, like just plot it out as a data frame, this entire test. So whatever you see this orange line here is, that will correspond to the predictions column that you see here. And whatever is the blue line is the label column that you see here. And what you'll see is that, well, we do see predictions that are going on after like August 26th, uh, 2019. But that mainly happens because we're seeing like the previous week had almost no sales. And because of that, we're predicting consistently low values, much lower than we would anticipate, which kind of makes sense. Like you can't expect our model to be, you know, great just after closures, just after a period of closures, you can't expect the model to just like come back up because that's just the nature of the data and how it is, right? I'm assuming though that like with actual realistic uh, shopper or order information, you would have like consistently daily volume that's coming in and potentially even more predictors from which you can inform your model about, you know, so that you can use other regressors. And yeah, so ideally you'd be able to even in real life make a more, um, uh, a more robust model than what we have here. But I hope that this entire I, this entire project kind of give you an intuition of what we could be expecting, right? And yeah, I'll put all of this code up on GitHub. Um, I do have like a tidbit of using, you know, Facebook's profit, um, that's Facebook's um, uh, interpretation of like approaching time series analysis. I do get like something here, but this is like for another time. I wanna kind of iron out these numbers a little better. Regardless, the code will be in the description down below. So if you like the video, give it a like, give it a thumbs up, share the video, like, comment, do everything you can. I'm trying to grow a community here and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.